welcome to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ, the podcast. I believe that the best coach you can ever have is that one person that is staring straight back at you every morning in the mirror, you. Join me in discovering some key strategies so that you can create an empowered life and inspire others to live theirs. Your journey to being your own best coach starts right now. I'm so excited today to be interviewing the amazing Colleen Callender. Now, Colleen is a former sports girl CEO and an inspirational leader, ambassador and mentor. Geelong born and raised, Colleen was brought up in a hardworking business focused family, having her first taste of retail at the age of 16. Unbeknownst to her, at the time, this summer job would be the start of a retail career spanning over 30 years. Now, Colleen loved to work from an early age, going to work with her father on building sites at any chance she got, working at her parents' pool canteen at the age of eight, working all day and then counting up buckets of coins of an evening with the one, two and five cent coins being her pay for the day. Colleen has a wealth of knowledge and a proven track record in building brands, creating a winning culture, building an environment that allows people to be inspired and empowered and is now sharing not only the past 13 years experience as a CEO, but the past 30 years of her retail career. Beyond her amazing career, the most important thing to Colleen is family. Colleen sees her most important and influential role in life as wife to Nick, mother of three beautiful humans, Jake 23, Trent 22 and Macy 15. She's a daughter, sister, sister-in-law and auntie to seven beautiful nieces and one nephew. Colleen is an inspiration to women of all generations and wants to encourage women globally to believe in themselves, their ability, share their voice, take action and bring equality into boardrooms, organisations, communities and even into the home. She wants women to believe in the power within and that it is possible to become the leader they always wanted to be in business and in life and together create a new era of leadership and change the rules. From an insert of Colleen's upcoming book, Colleen says, every woman has a superpower or maybe even two. You might not know it yet, or you may not yet have discovered yours, but I can promise you, you have one. Your superpower might be communication, caring, reliability, relationship building, collaboration, leadership, or carer. It's time to find your superpower and share it with the world. I'd like to introduce you to the amazing, my beautiful friend, Colleen Callender. Hello there. Thank you for that very big, long introduction. I know. I, was like, I, was, I had to try and take a breath. Um, and I've just realised something. It's been, how long have we been friends for? Oh, I would say it has to be. It'd have to be close to 30 years. Yeah, it? about 30 It'd years. Have to be 30 and what years. I've realised is now I know how we can catch up. I'll just do another podcast interview Perfect. and then we can catch well, We've got up. Zoom now. How good's that? We had a Zoom call last week and that was fantastic. <laughs> so, guys that are listening, you'll know, you might notice there'll be lots of podcasts with Colleen just because. <laughs> it's our catch up. Yeah, it's our catch up. So, um, it's great seeing you again, of course. I love you to death. Uh, and just thinking about your career, I mean, you've had a stellar 30-year retail career. It's just been amazing. Where did you start? Like, where did your career start? So first I have to say, when you say a 30-year retail career and we've been friends for 30 years, that makes me feel damn old. But, um, <laughs> but put that aside, um, it has been 30 years and I've got to say it's been an amazing 30 years. But um, if, I, if I wind back the clock... Um, I'll take you back to the day I finished year 11 and I remember that day really vividly and I was so excited about finishing school at the end of that school year um, and it wasn't because there was a summer break coming, it wasn't because I could hang out with my friends, it wasn't any of that. The real reason was that I'd got a job and I was so excited because I just loved to work um, and so for me um, 
going to work and and meeting people and and engaging with people was just something that I absolutely loved doing. So um, I started and I actually got the job through my brother. Someone said to him, we need a a casual at Just Jeans um, over summer. And my brother said, yeah, my sister will come and do it. I'm not sure why he didn't volunteer himself (laughs) because he had a great summer that year and I worked all summer. But um, Mm. anyway, so I started there over that summer break and I absolutely loved it. And I worked every single roster I possibly could. And of course, I've worked in mum and dad's businesses and I'd worked at a little ice cream shop. And But this was like a real job. You know, this was in the fashion industry and I was so excited. And so I, I really lapped it up. I, I loved customers. I loved selling. I loved connecting. I loved merchandising. And I really loved learning. And so at the end of that, um, that time, the manager and the area manager came to me and said, hey, Cole, you've just done an amazing job. Um, we'd really love you to stay on um, and we'd really love you to um, to join the, the Just Jeans team. And, I mean, who wouldn't have been excited at that at 16 and, yeah. you know, being able to stay in a place you really enjoyed. So um, that was fabulous. So I, I, and I'll talk about, you know, my telling my parents that decision a bit later, <laughs> but, um, but I, at 16, no formal education, uh, final, you know, uh, final, you know, HSC year, I entered this fabulous world of retail and little did I know that was where I was going to spend my next 30 years and for me and you know when I was sort of younger I was a a very quiet you know quiet sort of quite introverted person I've I've not always been loud and and um and uh and in people's you know spaces so I was quiet so I knew that I had to if I wanted to get recognized there was a lot of people around me screaming a lot louder than I did so if I wanted to get recognized I needed to get recognized through my results so that's what I did I worked really hard I was really passionate about what I did and I started going through the ranks and at the age of 19 I won the Kimberley Award which is one of the most prestigious awards in in the yeah. in the Just Jeans at that time and I was 19 so it was like the Logies it was like the Logies <laughs> and you know I look back on that time and I, I looked at a photo and I had double denim I had a pair of denim jeans and a denim jacket and I'm thinking oh if I knew what I know now I would not have dressed like that for a Logies Award but anyway <laughs> then I was promoted at the age of 20 to the youngest area manager and then by the age of 24, I was Vic State Manager looking after 54 stores and three direct reports. And that was where I spent the next four years of my retail career. And I absolutely loved it. Um, I loved every minute of it. But when I got a call from a brand that I'd always loved and, and grew up with, as we you know, all did, the yeah. iconic sports girl brand, when I got a call from them in 1999, which is exactly 20 years ago oh, wow. um, it was really hard to say no um, and so I joined the sports school business and that's where I've spent my past 20 years and um, as you said the last 13 as CEO um, seven years as CEO of sports girl and six of those years as CEO of Suzanne so yeah really just worked my way through yeah, I love it. And guys, some of you may not know, but I'm an old Just Jeans uh-huh. girl. So that's where we, we met. Have some history. I know. And I was there for t- so how long were you at Just uh, Jeans? Nearly nine years. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I I well I left for a little bit and came mm. back. So I was there for, t- for ten years all in total, yeah. and that's where we met. That's exactly. So that's why I know in the, the whole Wera- culture in the Werribee store. Yes. As well. Yes. It was the Werribee store. Yeah, yeah. It was. I was the store manager yes. there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. So often you credit your family upbringing mm. uh, with your success. How have your parents influenced you in business? Mm. Um, I do. And I, I say my parents have been a huge influence on not only the woman I am today, but also the leader I am. And if I think back to, and I'll share a bit of my, my parents' history with you, so, and you know my parents yeah. well, so, but my father uh, was an Italian immigrant and came out to Australia when he was four years of age with his brother and his mother and father um, with very little. They came out with a couple of suitcases, a little bit of money they'd saved and, um, and the clothes on their back. And so my father worked really hard, and so did his family. Um, so he he finished school at 14 as well. Um, he was young. He wanted to go to work. He wanted to earn money. He needed to support the family. Um, and he was very good with his hands, so he, he could build anything, and he still can. Yeah. Um, so he became a, a builder by day. He worked at the abattoirs by night. He, he was this absolute workhorse, and he really taught us and taught me the value of hard work and the value of money. 
and yeah. even still today, you know, um, you know, so many years on, he's in his seventies, and he'll still say, you know, you've got to work hard, and and you need to appreciate, you know, money doesn't come easy, and and so he demonstrated that through my whole life was that you had to work hard, and then I've got. My mum, Ronnie, who, again, you know, and she's a little bit like Mother Teresa. And she she's, is. She's just the most <laughs> incredible, incredible woman. She and, is. And her background was very different. She was one of 12 children um, and she had an alcoholic father um, and her mother died when she was 20 um, and she had two younger stepsisters and she had two young babies. And so her world was about nurturing and caring and she is just the most incredible nurturer and carer. Um, and so I look back on both of their, their sort of upbringings and how that's influenced me. And I, I feel very, um, very blessed that I got both sides. I got this business acumen from my father, who's quite a tough businessman. And, you know, and then yeah. I got this beautiful, caring way and nurture from my mother. And I, I put both of those together. And I, I think that that's been a real part of my success is, is my upbringing and, and what I took from each of them. Yeah, and I can so, knowing your family, mm. I so see that mm. and I so relate to that because my mum is very similar in regards to the nurturer and the carer mm. and my dad was pretty in your face. Mm. So I get the in the face, yeah. in the face from my dad and then my mum's the carer and the nurturer. So mm. I really connect with that. Yeah. Um, so as a mum of three kids or mm-hmm. grown kids, how did you navigate through the challenges, particularly when they were young, of mm. being a mum and expanding your career at the same time? How did you navigate through mm. that? Yeah, look, it, it was hard, right? Yeah. And I think probably the first thing that comes to mind when I think about that is that at time, and I'm sure you've got mums listening to your podcast, at time you just live with guilt. Yeah. Um, you have this thing about I'm not home, I'm, I'm pushing my career forward, my kids need me. Um, and as time went on, I realized that that just wasn't the case, Yeah. Um, that I was a better human and a better mother for actually having a nice balance in my life of being able to go to work, but also coming home to my beautiful family. So um, the, the, there was a couple of things, in, you know, for me. And the first one I would say was that I had to let go of trying to be perfect and striving for, for, for perfection. And because what I found, and I am a perfectionist by by nature, <laughs> as you know, um, and but what I found was that um, perfection was just leading to disappointment. Yeah. So I had to really stop trying to be a perfect mother, a perfect wife, a perfect sister, a perfect friend, and I just had to say I'm doing my best. Yeah. Um, and that's what I did every day. I said I'm getting up and I'm doing my best, and I needed to be kind to myself to do that. So that was probably the first thing I did. Uh, one of the other things I would say is that I set boundaries, not right at the start because you have to fall over a few times before you realize you need them, but boundaries were really important to me, particularly people who are workaholics because you can just burn yourself out very, very quickly. So even to this day, Janelle, I have set, you know, I have a very set time that is work and a very set time that is family. And I don't, I don't often mix the two. Um, and and I really do make sure um, that that happens. And when the kids were little, you know, you get invited to lots of things at school and I used to feel so bad and so guilty that I would say no. But what I was saying no to were things that weren't important to me. So yeah. as much as I'd love to go to a mother's lunch, um, that wasn't important to me. But it was important to go to the presentation that Jake was doing yeah. on, you know, some rocket that he'd made. You know, yeah. So I, I suppose the other thing was about really defining what matters when your kids are young and making sure you pick and choose. Yeah. Um, and the, I, so I think the biggest, um, the biggest thing for me um, and what allowed me to um, have, you know, such a beautiful family and home life and have such an amazing career was surrounding people that were my cheer squad. Yeah. Um, and surrounding people that wanted to love and support me because there's also plenty of people out there that don't want to love and support yeah. you and actually want to bring you back down and tell you you can't do things. And yeah. So I've been exceptionally lucky. As I said, my mother has been just the most amazing human being. Um, she was just there every step of the way. She still is. Yeah. Um, and just nurtured and loved my boys because they were babies at the time. So, you know, she was just an incredible, incredible person. And then also my husband, Nick, you know, I've been really super lucky that he had his own business and then he went into consulting. And so he had a lot of flexibility within his work. Um, so he really has been the one that's kept everything together and kept, you know, kept the family sort of dynamics working and, um, 
and really been, I suppose, my backbone. So the big takeout for me is to have people around you that can actually help you and yeah. are there to pick you up when you fall over because you are going to fall over. There's yeah. no question. And there'll be people waiting for you to fall over. Absolutely. But the naysayers that mm. – because I think what, what can happen is that when you're seen as successful, mm. other people are like – it's like – they want to bring you down to wherever they're at so that they feel comfortable. Do you, did you find that Absolutely. in your journey? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah. And I think it's, I probably didn't realize that at the time. Uh, I, yeah. I realize it now in, you know, I think, you know, in your, I mean, my 40s, I'm nearly, I'm 50 next year, but you, as you grow and, and get, you know, smarter and learn, I think you look back and you think, wow, you know, that person wasn't there for my best interest. So yeah. surround the people that are there for your best interest and really love and support you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love that. And with, you know, with your kids and um, we talk about work-life balance mm -hmm. and, and you talk about work-life balance is a term, it's thrown around a lot. Mm -hmm. but what are your thoughts on it? Because I know that you think a little bit differently in regards mm -hmm. to work-life balance. Yeah, I do. Do you know, I'm actually really not a huge fan of work-life balance yeah. um, in, in, the, in the context of that. I really think about it as life in balance. Yeah. And um, for me, it's, it's really about, I suppose, making sure that, you know, there's so many people that talk about, oh, I've got a great work-life balance um, or I haven't got a great work-life balance. Yeah. And I just don't understand why we have to put life into um, two boxes. We don't yeah. have to put our life into work and then our life and then our life. For yeah. me, it's about family, it's about friends, it's about relationships, it's about community, and of course it's about work. Yeah. But it doesn't need to be put into two separate boxes. So I, I'm really a fan of life in balance. Yeah. And uh, when I talk about life in balance, I think about the 80-20 rule. And yeah. I, I apply 80-20 to a lot of things that I do in my life. Um, yeah. And that's not to say that everyone needs to do an 80-20 rule. There's, you know, people that don't want to do an 80-20 rule. You do whatever rule works for you, you know. Yeah. But for me, it's about saying 80% of my life is in balance and the other 20 might be out of balance because yeah. we're not perfect again. You know, there are yeah. going to be things that go wrong in life. And um, if I get to a point where... Um, uh, you know, and we get stressed and, and we have anxiety and we do all of those kind of things. So, but if I get to a point where my um, life in balance is not an 80 20, then I know something's wrong. Yeah. Um, and I know that I need to address and make some kind of change to get that my life back in balance. So, I very much check in with myself and make sure that that is. And, you know, it's interesting. People say, oh my God, I, I, I need to get better work life balance. So, um, I'm going to start yoga. I'm going to do yoga every <laughs> night after work. Oh, I'm, I'm going to meditate in the morning before I start work because yeah. that's going to make me feel much more, you know, much better about work-life balance. Well, that's actually a load of rubbish. Yeah. Not to say meditation's not fabulous and yoga's fabulous. Absolutely, they're great. Yeah. But there is something else happening in your life yeah. if your life is in is out of balance. Yeah. Um, and so you've got you, you need to you need to fix the part in the middle yeah um, and and so for me that's always been a real focus and you know I say to people if if it's not working and your your life is an imbalance to whatever you want that percentage to be yeah. 80 20 like me then you have to change something yeah um, and I give the example and this was someone who worked with me and they were late every single day for work, right? Every yeah. single day. And you would see, I'd see them from my office driving the car park and they go, oh shit, there's no car parks left. I've got to back back out again. And yeah. you know, I've got to go and find a park down the road. Now I'm even going to be later. But this was like a reoccurring event, right? Yeah. And so I, I one day said, you know, you need to, oh, and she, oh I'm, I'm just, oh, I'm so, work-life balance is just not working for me and I'm so stressed. And I said, well, you need to change something. Because yeah. you do the same behaviour every single day. Stressing out every day trying to get every a car day You walk into the office and you're yeah. stressed because you have run late every day. So you either need to set your alarm a bit earlier, you either need to change your morning routine, or you need to change the time you start. Yeah. Because if you walk into this office feeling uh, in control and yeah. not stressed, you're going to have a much better day and yeah. you're going to feel your life is in much better balance by doing that. Yeah. So, so I would say to anyone that feels like they're not getting a uh, work-life balance, if that's yeah. what they want to call it, or their life isn't in balance, then they, yeah. the, the best thing is to have a look and, and maybe delete some things from, from that that non-balanced part or, or change some things. Yeah, and I think what you said before about really categorising life and balance, when you do that, you see it completely differently. I mean, one of the 
um, amazing, I think, who's one of the top peak performance coaches in the world, Tony Robbins. Yeah. He often call, talks about life integration, so mm. like and work, uh, work and life integration. Yes. So they, how do you blend mm. the, two? the two? So so it's just, as you said, it's life. It's life. It's just how you do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mm. I love that. Uh, what has been your biggest challenge in mm. business? Look, I think the business world is just ever-changing and ever-evolving, right? Yeah. So I think the biggest challenge for not only my the businesses I've been CEO of or really any businesses out there is to continue to evolve and not to stay yeah. still. Yeah. Um, you know, the internet has been the biggest disruptor to, to the entire world. So um, that, that would probably, I would say, be the biggest challenge is continuing, even though both of the brands I've been CEO of are both iconic Australian brands, but you're only iconic if you're good enough. Yeah. And you have to keep evolving and, you know, you can't rest on I'm an iconic brand. So it really is, I suppose, the challenge is how do you keep moving? How do you keep evolving? How do you stay relevant to the consumer? How do you move along the continuum with them? And, um, you know, I always talk about today is not good enough just to sell stuff because anyone can sell stuff. You know, yeah. you can go and buy a white T-shirt anywhere. You can go and buy a pair of jeans anywhere. Of course, you've got your favorites, but you have to connect with your customer and yep. the brands that are going to survive in the future are the ones that connect with their customer on a much deeper level than just selling them something, Yeah, really standing for something. So I would say that's been the big challenge is continuing to evolve over um, a very changing landscape. Yeah, and I mean, we're at, right now we're, it's COVID-19 yes. times yeah. and this is really showing the businesses mm-hmm. that are either innovating and changing and transforming mm-hmm all the ones that will be left behind. Yeah. So it's really showing that strength in different businesses. Absolutely. And I think I think Janelle, you know, there are, you know, there'll be I always I always say great leaders will, will be become greater. Yeah. Great businesses will get greater. Um, and ones that were maybe not so good won't survive unfortunately. So I do think it will separate, you know, the great from the good. Um, yeah. but I also think um, you know, in these kind of times um, talking about COVID-19, you know, you can either go high or you can go low. Yeah. And you can start to say things like, oh, this is really shit and the world's a disaster and I can't believe that I'm in isolation for eight weeks with my husband and three screaming kids. Yeah. Or, you know, whatever the case yeah. may be, you can go low and you can really find the negative around the whole COVID-19. And don't get me wrong, it is an absolute pandemic and, yeah. and it is not a place we want to be, but... You can go high or low and there are people that will choose to go high and yeah. brands that will choose to go high and leaders that will choose to go high. And, you know, I, I said about the whole COVID-19, you know, I've been obviously finished uh, in my CEO role in March. I've been so busy because yeah. I've chosen to go high and I've yeah. chosen to keep busy. And one of the things I talked to myself about was, Cole, one of the things you always say you haven't got not enough of is time. And now all of a sudden, you've got all this time. So what are you going to do with it? Yeah. So I do think these sort of um, challenging moments make people go high or low, and it gives great opportunity for new thinking, reinvention, reimagining, you know, reworking. I think that there will be a lot of, out of the really bad time and, and the tough stuff, I think there will be a lot of good that comes out of this for a lot of people that want to go high. Yeah. For... For people that love perfection, mm-hmm. <laughs> not looking at anyone, Pick me. Uh, certainty is really important to them. Mm-hmm. So that gives them the sense of control. And us as humans love certainty. It's yes. like, okay, I, I've got control of this. Mm-hmm. Whereas we're in times where there's no, everything's mm-hmm. so uncertain. Yeah. Um, how did you process that from someone that loves to get things right, is such mm-hmm. an achiever? How did you balance that? How did you... You know, what strategies did you have in your mind or your thinking when there's so much uncertainty? Yeah, I I mean, I'm such an optimistic person by nature as well. So perfectionist, yes. Optimistic, also yes. So I can always find, as I said, always go high. I can always find the upside. I can always find 
um, the positive in any situation and, and that yeah. is a mindset and you know we were talking yeah. about this before the, the podcast but you know I always take that positive mindset that um, you know and I, I have three as you said three children 23 22 and 15 so I need to be great for them to make yeah. sure that they stay in a positive mindset and find good things out of this as well homeschooling doing uni online so um, yeah I think it's about just readjusting and I think um, because I haven't been in the office, you know, and I've been here, uh, that's just been fabulous for me. So I feel like I've been able to sort of navigate it really easily and help navigate my family through it as well. Yeah, and one thing that I see that, and it's been a pattern since I've always known you, mm-hmm. is that you take action. Yeah. And so even when maybe things are uncertain, even if maybe you don't even know how to do something mm-hmm. for the first time, mm-hmm. Think you know, just taking that action yeah. can help you with that uncertainty yeah. as well. Absolutely, like yeah. never have a, a, any regrets of not having a go. Yeah, you know, have a go. Yeah. Absolutely, I love that. So there was a time in your career that we talked about, and I remember that time with you. Is that and you called it a burnout? Mm. That you faced a burnout. Tell me about that time. Yeah, that was a really. Um, you know, I've always said the day I get up and can't give a hundred percent to something. Um, or the day I get up and don't love what I do is the day I won't turn up. Yeah. Um, and it was 2007 and I was 36 years of age. I had my three kids by then, obviously, and Macy was only two and Jake was 10 and Trent was nine. Um, and I was uh, general manager of Sports Girl at the time. So I'd been on this crazy, crazy mouse wheel for eight years and, you know, full on, not off. I hadn't, I hadn't got off the mouse wheel and... I hit a wall. I hit burnout and I didn't even know it at the time. I just remember saying to my husband, I can't get up and do this again tomorrow. I don't want to do it again tomorrow. And it wasn't that I didn't love my job or love the people that were in my in my world. I just didn't have anything left. And um and I, I, you know, explain it now that, you know, I was this red Ferrari, um, but I had, had no petrol. I put no petrol in my tank yeah. and I hadn't put myself in for a service um, and I'd burnt my wheels out. So, you know, a Ferrari doesn't run that well when you, when you don't look after it. And yeah. so I really had just burnt myself out. And so I, I went in and it literally happened like this. I, I came home and said to my husband, I'm not going, I'm not doing it anymore. Um, and I went in the next day and resigned, and that's also a bit of me. Yeah. Um, and I was really lucky um, that I actually got talked out of that idea. Yeah. Um, and uh, so what I did instead was actually took four months off, um, and I took four months to re-energize myself and put myself back together and yeah. focus on me. Um, and not just me, but my whole family, yeah. because when you have burnout, you don't just affect you, you f- affect everyone around you that has to live with, with you. So, so I actually took four months off and that was probably the big turning point in my life in terms of self-preservation. Yeah. Um, and knowing that if I kept going at that rate and that pace, that, um, I was not going to make it to 50. Um, so, and it wasn't to say, Janelle, and you know me, it wasn't to say I didn't want to work hard, um, because that is me, that is my nature. Yeah. It was, I just needed to work smarter yeah. and I needed to know when the pause points were that I needed to stop and refuel the tank when I needed to pull into the petrol station and refuel. And I had not recognized that for that entire time. So I think about my forties, uh, you know, my back into my thirties and then in my forties and the way I've lived my life has been quite different. It has been about self-preservation. It has been about, unless I'm good to myself, I can't actually be good to anyone else. So um, it, it was that pause point that really made me stop and think about what I needed to do going forward in my, in my sort of working world. Um, and then I returned four months later and I was just on fire, like mm-hmm. I was charged. And I took over um, as CEO of Suzanne at that time. And that's where I stayed for the next six years before then taking over um, Sports Girl. But it was it was probably the best lesson in self-care ever. And how did you, I, I imagine you giving yourself a talking to because mm-hmm. I know you really well yeah. and I've got this similar trait mm-hmm. that with hard work, it's like, 
Mm. Yeah, I, hard work is really important. Mm. And so I, I joke to some of my clients and sometimes I say it in my speeches is that, you know, that ad where, where people are sick, soldier on with cultural. Yes. Yes. That would be me. Yes. yes. I, I would, I would wear it like a badge of honor mm. as if I'm sick, but I can still keep going. Yeah. And so I can imagine you would have had to, you know, talk to yourself and go, mm-hmm. hold on a minute. This is what I need. It's not giving up. It's not, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, this is what I need to do for me. Yeah. And you're so like, you're absolutely a hundred percent right. Cause I, and you would have been the same. I would never take a sick day. Yeah. And when it actually, when you actually pull all the layers back and ask ourselves, why, why were we like that? It's because we never want to disappoint anyone. Yeah. And, and so I had to stop saying to myself, I have to please other people um, and I have to be there every day for everyone else. And I actually had to look after me. So I think it actually, whenever we come across those things, if we pull the layers back, there's something else underneath it. And yeah. for me, it was I had to stop pleasing everyone else. Yeah. And I had to be kind to myself. Yeah. yeah. And then you, you you can look back in the past and actually see that there's a pattern. Absolutely. <laughs> That's yes. what I did. Yeah. Like I saw that there was a pattern mm. of behavior that you yes. did. And when it stops and, and you, you know, you put the oxygen mask on for you before mm-hmm. you help others, mm-hmm. you can be so much more productive and, yeah. and achieve so much more. Absolutely. Love that. So what has been your biggest learnings? Mm. I know you've had such a big career yeah. and, um, you know, what have been your biggest learnings? Mm, okay, so I, I've had, wow, I've had so many learnings, right? Yeah. And I, I even talk about right now, I'm still a student of learning every day. And yeah. and that's one thing I know you love to do um, is continue to learn and I love to continue to learn. But I have had some really great learnings. And, and I think probably one of, the, one of the biggest ones I think would be that um, focus on what's in your control. Yeah. Um, You know, there's so many external factors in this world that can completely derail us overnight or in a split second um, if we let them do that. And so I think probably the biggest learning is to really focus on what's in my control um, and what's important. Um, And particularly in business, if, if I think about business and and, and, you know, focusing on your own business and your people and what's in your control. And we can always get very carried away with what are, for me, you know, what are other retailers doing or who's doing something better or who's got a better dress out there or whatever the case may be. And, and I'll tell you this funny story. Well, it's not funny, but this little story is I met this CEO um, of another large fashion chain at a dinner. And, of course, I won't say who, who yeah. or what that was. But um, And so I was actually sitting next to this person, a fabulous, fabulous guy, and I really yeah. had a great connection and, and really nice, made lots of great conversation. And he turned to me and said, I really love what you're doing at Sports Girl. And, um, and he said, um, you're just doing a fabulous job and, you know, you really stand out there as a retailer of today. And I'm like, thank you so much. That's wonderful. And he said, yeah, we have our morning meeting every Monday at a sports girl store. We go to one of your stores every single week on a Monday morning. And I thought to myself, wow, really? And I thought, wow, let me think about my reflection of a Monday. My Monday morning is being with my team. It's meeting my executive team first up. It's meeting the entire team secondary it's talking about what our successes were for the week it's talking about what we did well what we didn't do well how do we have to pivot this week what's what's new what's old what you know it is about us it is about us as a leadership team and a team um, of of incredible people um, to how we can actually navigate our business to the coming week and I thought wow if you're really that focused on my business that might be why your business isn't doing so well, right? Yeah. Um, and so for me, it was about this This person was so focused on the external factors and what everyone else in the marketplace was doing. And I thought, I feel really sorry for your people because yeah. you're so focused on everyone else. Maybe if you focus back on your team and your people, you might be getting a better result. So yeah. So I think for me, it really is that, you know, making sure that we focus on what's in our control and what's important and nurturing our people all the time. Yeah, and I, one thing I love about you, t- talk to me about in your office, talking about communication mm. just then. You mentioned that you don't have a computer. Is that mm. right in your office? Tell me about that because I have never 
known any CEO, and I've worked with a lot of people and a lot, a lot of them are clients. I've never had one CEO that has not had a computer in their office. I know people really love, and I must, I must actually say, in the last few years, I have had a laptop in my office, but it's not a work computer. It's just my personal computer, yeah. which I have. You know, my EA would send me things on. But stepping back, right to when I took over as CEO um, thirteen years ago, I didn't want a computer, and um, and that was because, and my my EA at the time also didn't want me to have a computer right because uh, she wanted to control all of that and she knew how bad I would be on a computer you yeah. know, if I start booking in meetings and oh that would just be an absolute disaster so I didn't have a computer and the guy came around he said oh welcome Colin you're in your new office and can I set up your computer and I said oh no I don't want one and he looked at me like are you normal yeah um, but for me a computer one I don't like that stuff yeah, you know, I don't like admin very much. Yeah. Um, so for me, I didn't want to be. I was in a new business. I'd never worked in the Suzanne business before. I wanted to immerse myself in the brand and learn about the people. And if I had a computer and had to answer emails and do all that sort of stuff, that would have taken time away from yeah. me. And I didn't want to do that. So I literally, and I've had only two EAs in my entire 20 years, and both of them are just the most spectacular human beings um, and literally run my have run my life for me, which is yeah. great. Um, but it, for me, it was about being with the people. It was about every morning walking through the office and saying, hi, yeah. how are you? What are you doing? Oh, I love that that hanging there when when's that arriving what's going on what were your best sellers from yesterday tell me about that for me connection is absolutely absolutely so important to the success of any leader and any business so yeah I just didn't want to I say when you're not good at something hire someone that is yeah right (laughs) Uh, so I hired two of the best DAs so I didn't have to do any of that yeah I love that um now as You've been mentor, a mentor to so many people, including myself. What mentors have you had in your life mm. that have been really helpful to your journey? Yeah, I think that's such an important one, right? And to have those people around you that, um, you know, you can ring if you need help or you maybe just aspire to the way they do something and you think, oh, if I added that to my repertoire, that would be really good for my leadership or or my business or, or whatever that may be. I mean, obviously my parents have been just the most incredible mentors. You know how much I, I absolutely just, yeah, the, two, two of the most beautiful people on this planet. Um, so they've just been incredible my whole life and just supported me. My husband, Nick, as you know, he's just such an incredible support yeah. and, you know, he is, he is out there. He is the cheer squad leader and don't worry he's got some pom-poms and his little frilly skirt going don't, on I've got a vision yeah I've got it's a not vision. a good it's not a good one but you know he is my cheerleader he's yeah. always there saying you can do this you've got this you've you know it's okay um so he's been fantastic as well um but there, there has been one person in particular who's been an incredible mentor and I've been very fortunate to have a life coach for the last 10 yeah. years um, and you're a life coach as well yeah. and so I think anyone that can tap into someone like yourself or my life coach like yeah. Shanna Kennedy who's just again one of the most amazing human beings on the planet um, if you can tap into or have whether it be a life coach a mentor or some support system around you um, I think that makes such a world of difference to people yeah and you know, she's been there as I said, for 10 years to challenge me, um, to push me, uh, to set boundaries for me, um, you know, to, to, to navigate me in the right direction. Um, and, and she can say it really bluntly to me as well, you know, Yeah. and that's, that's a great thing about a coach too. Right. So, um, she's just been a fantastic person. And, uh, and I think if you can and have the ability to invest in a coach, then that's great. Or find a mentor, but also um, make sure for me as a leader, it was also making sure that I surrounded my people with the right mentors and coaches um, around them as well. So my team, my executive team, were also very fortunate to have Shanna as part of their coaching um, life yeah. um, as well. So yeah, that's that's been a, a really fantastic one for me. And um, and now, particularly in this last couple of months where I've had the time, I've really enjoyed mentoring many other people because I've been given that gift um, over time. And, um, you know, sometimes it's just that one thing you say to someone where they have a little bit of self-doubt and you can just say one little thing to them and all of a sudden, you know, they've got the confidence to do that and the confidence to push forward. And they always did. They just needed someone to believe in them. Yeah, I um, love that. So I know you're pa- you're so passionate about leadership. What... What is leadership for you? Mm. Yes. Do you know that's the 
the number one question I get asked outside of work-life balance, but yeah. <laughs> the number one question I get asked is about, you know, Cole, tell us about leadership. You know, what is your leadership style? What does leadership mean to you? And I always start uh, by saying what leadership is not. And I've actually talked about this to the entire you know, Sports Girl Network um, o- over time. And I start by saying that leadership is not about a title. It's not about a level of authority. It's not about the size of your office. It's not about the number of direct reports you have. It's not about how much money you earn. And it's definitely not whether you get a car park or not, right? Yeah. If you're running late, that's you know a bonus. But it's <laughs> none of those things. Um, and, you know, Janelle, in my early days of, of um, uh, my career, I thought that those things were what made leaders. You know, if you had the big office in the corner, oh, they're important, you yeah. know, or, or if you drove the nice car or if you, you know, you, you were the one that had authority or power, then you're a leader. And what I learned over my career is that many of those people weren't. Yeah. Just because of those titles and, and all of those attributes did not make them leaders. And so over the time, I, I became a built my leadership on observation and, and that was something I was really keen to to explore and so for me I listened I took notes I asked questions you know and you do that why why yeah. why um, and I was really intrigued my whole sort of my whole career really been really intrigued about both good um, and bad behaviors yeah in leadership and wondered why and um, you know, I've always had this fasc- fascination with human behavior and I've always wondered, you know, why do some people t- uh, treat some with kindness and respect and others step over people to get where they want to go? Or, um, you know, why do some leaders and people create environments of fear and others create environments of collaboration? Yeah. Or, you know, why are people caring and others cruel? Or why, why are some people really generous and others greedy? So yeah. I've always had this fascination about... Um, and and been very intrigued about human behavior. And so over my 30 years, I've come up with my own leadership um, um, definition. And and, if you pick the dictionary up, it says directive and authoritative and, you know, captainship and all of these words. And so my definition of leadership is is leadership is about one life impacting another in a positive way. Now, you don't have to be a CEO to do that. Yeah. But I talk about leadership is about taking care of people around you. Leadership is about making those around you thrive and shine. You know, it's about taking care of the ones to the left and the ones to the right and even some of the ones that are lagging behind and giving them a bit of a push along. You know, it's, it's not necessarily about you doing great things, but it's about encouraging and inspiring and leading others to do great things. Yeah. And by the way, giving them the credit for it, right? Yeah. You know, a leader... You have to take you, you have to cop it when it's not good and you have to give the credit away when things yeah. are good, <laughs> yeah. you know? And yeah. you, you get a vote, you, yeah. you don't get it any which way. Yeah. But that's a great leader, is that you always credit your people for great work um, and not yourself. You know, it, I always talk about it as being this heart set and, and this real feeling that you have for people. And um, you know, it's about believing in in someone when they don't believe in themselves. And you know, like I said before, you can say to someone, I believe in you. And maybe that's all the words they needed to hear for them to actually take that next step or take that leap or leap of faith. Um, you know, so yeah, for me, um, you know, that leadership is about one life impacting another. And, and again, it doesn't have to be in a business world. Um, uh, I'll give, talk to you about it. i give you an example. I spoke at the Elizabeth Murdoch dinner last year, maybe early the year before. And, um, that was the year 10, 11, 12 cohort at Geelong Grammar. Yeah. And just the most amazing bunch of young women, like so, so fabulous. And, you know, I talked to them about, I was talking about leadership. And, you know, I, I said to them, the girls, and they had all their parents there on this beautiful dinner. And I said, every single one of you young ladies in the room are leaders. Uh, you know, whether you're the captain of a sporting club here or whether you're the captain of your house or what, that doesn't matter every single one of your leaders, if you believe in my definition, which yeah. is um, leadership is about one life impacting another in a positive way. We all have the ability to do that every single day that we get out of bed. And yeah. so I was saying to them, whether you, uh, you know, supporting someone through a challenging time or whether you're encouraging someone else to do their best or whether you're just creating teamwork and harmony in your, you know, Elizabeth Murdoch house, everyone has the ability to be a leader and you definitely don't need to be a CEO and you definitely don't need a title. 
Yeah, all mums and dads are leaders. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And it must really, you must be really thrilled in watching how your leadership and the people that have you've led mm. and what they've created. Mm, mm. You know, so I'm one of them yes. because we worked together for you know for I don't know how many years ago. Yes. But anyway, so you know now I'm on my own business, my own paths. Yeah. Um, it's I know for me it's so beautiful watching mm. people that mm. you've worked with and know that you've had an impact yeah. on somebody. Yeah. And you must be really thrilled watching absolutely. different people that have worked with you. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much because that's a beautiful comment. And as you said, you know, you've had this massive, uh, you know, growth path yourself in, into, you know, your own business and, and growing that business. And, you know, for me, that's watching people shine is such a joy. Um, yeah. And, you know, that has always, always been part of the way, you know, my leadership style has been. Um, is you know watching people as I said believe in themselves when when they didn't or achieving something they didn't think they could achieve or taking that next step so for me the biggest joy is watching people shine yeah Mm. I love that so you mentioned that leadership is a lifestyle choice Mm. what do you mean by that yeah so um I mean leadership is bloody hard right it's Mm -hmm. awesome it's awesome but it's hard so it's not something you can just turn on and off and do one day and not the next. It's it's something you have to work at. I'm still working at it. Yeah. You know, it's something you have to work at all the time. And, you know, I liken leadership to, you know, parenting or being healthy. And, you know, they're both lifestyle choices, right? So, um, you know, if you want to have a healthy lifestyle, you've got to work at it every day. You have to eat right. You have to sleep right. You have to go to the gym or do yoga or walk or do whatever you do. Um, but you have to do that as a lifestyle choice. You can't just do that for a week. We can't just say, I'm going to work, I'm going to eat well for a week and I'm going to go to the gym this week and then I'm set for life. I'm good. Yeah. You know, that doesn't work like that. You have to continue to work at it day in, day out if you want to have a healthy life. You know, parenting is exactly the same. And I liken leadership very much to parenting, as you just said. Yeah. You know, very much. There are so many similarities. And um, you know, I think about when I first found out that I was pregnant with Jake, which is, you know, 24 years ago yeah. now, and I can still remember it because there was this absolute joy and excitement. And then there was just this holy hell of fear, <laughs> you know, and it was like, wow, I've never been a parent before. I don't know how to do this. And, yeah. you know, we didn't have all of the tools and resources we have today, right? We didn't have yeah. podcasts. We didn't have any of that yeah. sort of stuff. So, you know, for me, it was about, you know, and if someone had been able to give me a magic book to say, here's how to be a parent or a magic book to say, here's how to be a leader, how wonderful. Shit, I would have got a loan for that. But that's not life. <laughs> yeah, literally, you know, it's yeah. just not life. So... You know, it was about, you know, if I go back to the parenting thing, for me, it was about, you know, learning from, from, you know, other people and learning from my friends. And, you know, you were there at that time when yeah. I was pregnant with Jake and, you know, my mum, I wanted to take as many leaves out of her book. So, cause I knew she was a fabulous yeah. mother and I bought every book and parent magazine and I tried to learn and I tried to upskill myself how to be a good parent. Yeah. And you know, I think about today and, you know, I, the things I, you know, the the way I parented when my kids were young are different to the way I parent now when yeah. they're in their, you know, teenage and, and adult, young adult life. So every day I'm learning to be a better parent. And so leadership for me is exactly the same. There is no magic book on being a leader. Um, but what I have always done is taken all of those learnings from along my journey and try to apply them to the leader I want to be. Yeah. Um, and so I do believe that we can be leaders by design. Yeah. And, and we can mould ourselves into the, into the kind of leaders that we want to be. And I think what I know about you that's really great and, and why I think you are such a great leader is that you take on, you look for feedback. Mm. So feedback from whether you're managing someone and if that didn't work out well, so then you go, okay, well, what can I change? Mm. And so you're taking in that feedback to say, okay, how can I continue to improve and continue to improve every single day? And it, and one of my coaches say, said to me, you know, you never land in learning. It's not yes. like, okay, I'm there I'm now, there. I'm done, no. beautiful, I'm a great leader now no. and that's it. It's, it's you're always, if you're open to learning That's right. and you're open to that feedback and sometimes that feedback can be challenging yeah. too, uh, that's when you can really mm-hmm. shine and, and be really the best so. version of yourself. Absolutely. I so again, you know, some of that, and I'm sure you're the same, some of probably the toughest feedback we've been given in our lives 
is probably some of the best feedback we've also been given in our lives yeah. in terms of our growth. And, you know, I, I think that's absolutely so true what you just said. Yeah. So in your career, what are you most what's what's been the biggest achievement that you've been proud of? Mm. Yeah, look, I, I mean, when I talk about people, um, you know, the, the people are the thing I'm most proud of all the time, whether yeah. it be creating a new team or, you know, there wouldn't be one defining moment where I say, you know, oh, I got promoted to here and that was the best thing ever. You know, of course, all of that was fabulous along the journey. But again, you know, the, the thing I'm proud of is that I've been able to be a leader that has has been a leader that people have wanted to follow. Um, because of the way I have led um, and so proud of all of the things that they've done. Um, I suppose one of the, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm sort of proud of, but also it, it concerns me as well, is that, you know, I am one of, you know, 15% in Australia. You know, I'm one of the CEOs, which represents only 15% of female CEOs yep. in Australia. So for me, that's a huge achievement and I'm really super proud of that. But it also saddens me quite a bit as well because we don't have enough female CEOs in the country. We don't have enough female leaders. And so I, as a part of my life, I want to really encourage more women leaders of the future. And, you know, it's our job, yours and my job, you yeah. know, to create great role models and be great role models, right? We want people to to try and emulate, you know, some of the things that we do and say, yeah. I'd love to be like them. And so for me, it's really about creating great role models, being a great role model, being a mentor to people. And, you know, I, I'm very passionate about bringing equality to, if I talk about business, but bringing equality to, um, to boardrooms and organisations and, and all sorts of areas, politics and, you know, communities. Yeah. I think, you know, and, and I want to be really clear, I'm not trying to be a crazy feminist by any stretch of the imagination. I, I'm, say, I'm not saying that men leaders are better than women leaders or women leaders are better than men leaders. They're both equally in, as important as yeah. each other, right? They both need to exist, but we need to get some more balance. Yeah. We need to get much more balance in the world we live in because... Men bring great attributes and different styles and, and, and different assets to the table. And as I said, they're all as important as each other. But we, I, I really believe we need to, in this new era of leadership that I keep talking about, we need to bring kindness and compassion and inclusivity and collaboration into organizations and into the world that we live in for for the success of our future all of our future so why do you think because the same thing if i look at speakers mm. and it's one of the thing that i'm really passionate about mm. is that you look at the speaker circuit mm. and majority of them are men so mm. it's you know i don't know what the statistics are but it's probably mm. 90 10 mm. percent mm. yeah. women and so why do you you think that there are not more women CEOs. Mm. Why do you think? Do you think it's how society is? Do you think women aren't seeking that? What are, you, what are your mm. thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I think there's a lot of things, right, contributing that to that. I think there's always been this stigma that um, women are the, you know, they take care of the home and the kids and, and you know, they can have a part-time job and that's okay, you know, so you can have a bit of spending money for yourself and so you can feel a bit independent. So yeah. I think it's been, I think women, you know, for a very long time, and look, it is starting to change, but it's not changing fast enough. But I think for a very long time it has been, you know, women are, are the, the caretakers and, and the homemakers and and you know all of that and so I think that's one part of it um, and I don't think women have been confident enough to say no I can do this I can actually juggle both I can do both yeah. so uh, you know I think that's a bit of it I think that women you know I think men put their hand up and say pick me I'm good yeah. for this job and you know I've got this and women are, are much more conservative and they don't go out and sell themselves to the same degree yeah and certainly not what I've seen in, in my 30 year history you know they don't go out and self promote. You know, um, so so there's not as much of that, you know, not as much, not as many women being noticed. Um, and then there's the you promote and, and recruit like-minded people, right? So yeah. men are recruiting men, recruiting yeah. the same kind of person. So yeah. I really believe we need to break that mould. And so the more women we get into leadership roles and the more women we have as CEOs, the more nurturing, mentoring, compassion we're going to have and we will start to bring new female leaders to the forefront and, and start to change that 15% number because it is just, it, it's just far too long. Yeah, and I love, one of the things I do as a speaker coach is, yes, working for men and women, 
I see the differences mm. and they might seem really small mm. but that they're actually big differences yes. and one of them that that comes to mind just now is when I say to a, a a woman speaker, she stands up and I say, okay, I want you to introduce yourself, say your title and your name. Mm. The title and their name, it's like they, it, they, they'll go quieter. So it's like, mm. I'm a CEO. Yeah. My name is Colin. Mm. So they, they actually do, they downplay, yes, yeah. whereas men do the opposite. Yes. And this is a big generalisation. Sure. But it means like, I'm the CEO and my name's John Smith. Yes. Like it's really powerful. Uh, and and as you said, I think there's such a great opportunity mm. for businesses to and the speaker circuit to have a balance of both because there's strengths and areas of development in both sides. I wouldn't even call them sides, but in male and female, there's yes. so many aspects that we can learn from each other. Mm. And I think that's when we can really be a strong. Um, strong team and uh, yeah I think there's heaps of opportunities out there yeah absolutely and I know you're very passionate about that as I am is how to create more female leaders for the future yeah Mm. what what are your what values do you live by as a leader Hmm. I'm I'm very strong on my values and uh, and I know them very very well. <laughs> well, you're getting hoity toity. Uh, yes, now. <laughs> I know. Uh, you know, it, it's something that's very very important to me. Yeah, yeah. as as it is you, I know Janelle. Yeah. Um, but you know, my my five values are family number yeah. one, health yeah. number two, um, integrity is number three, and really living by those values and um, you know really making sure that honesty and trust. Is at the uh, is the absolute forefront of everything I do and the way I live my life. Um, I'm an achievement junkie, so I have to be really careful with that because I'm I want to over I'm an overachiever, right? Yeah, as you are. We're all, we're we're kind of two of this. We are one of the same, really. <laughs> so I will put a lot on my plate. You know, I want to. I like a full plate. I don't want a plate half full. I want a full plate all the time. So I need to make sure that I don't put too much on that plate and that I I keep that in balance as well. But I'm an achievement junkie. Um, and the other is happiness. You know, that is that is a value of mine. I mean, shit, why do we want to live on this earth if we're not going to actually make the most of it and be happy? You know, who wants to get up every day and be sad? You know, so one of the things that I, I, I get up every morning and I find the joy in being alive. Yeah. Know? I mean, how, how you wouldn't be dead for quits, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, how lucky are we? Yeah. So I, I, I'm very strong on my values and I live by them every day. Beautiful. So goal setting as a leader is an important part of creating future results. Instead of New Year's resolutions, which often people will talk about, like, I've got a New Year's resolution, Mm -hmm. Um, you talk about this differently with your team. So Mm. what strategies have you – what's that strategy that you implemented? I love this that you talked about. So um, I hate New Year's resolutions because as a you know young adult, I would do my New Year's resolution and I would say probably by the 8th of January that was out the window, right? And um, <laughs> if you actually look at statistics, I think it's about the 15th of January, you know, majority of people's New Year's resolutions. So why do we... Why do we plan something that we know we're going to fail at, right? And yeah. then be miserable because we haven't achieved something. So I, um, a few years, probably three or four years ago now, um, and I don't even know where I came up with it or, or where I heard it um, or whether I made it up myself. So I'm going to credit myself right now <laughs> um, because I can't remember. But um, um, I, I, I said to my team, I, and I, I said that exact story. It was at the end of the, the year and we were going on Christmas break. And I said, I really want you to think about your word for the next year. Um, and a word that you can live by for the whole year. And not to say that that word just had to relate to business. That word could have all of these offshoots. It yeah. could be their word. and it could. Be. So one of them, just for an example, one girl said to me or one of my staff said, um, my word for next year is going to be step up. Yeah. Um, and I said, well, that's fantastic. Tell me about that. And that step up was not just in her work world because she wanted to be heard more and she felt that when she was at meetings, she wasn't being listened to properly. So she really wanted to be wanted to step up and be more assertive with the way she you know, uh, put her ideas forward and her feedback. But also in her personal life, she needed to step up in her relationship. So yeah. uh, the word doesn't just necessarily um, relate to your business. So I started this this year, you know, that, that four years ago, asking everyone for their word and um, everyone loved it and not 
uh, we got past the 15th of Jan, people were still talking about it. In fact, they talked about it all year. Yeah. And it was really, really fabulous. And um, people would come past and say, oh, Cole, when you've got five minutes, and these weren't people on my executive team. These were people in the business. And they'd say, yeah. Cole, when you've got five minutes, I really want to share my word with you. And I remember someone coming to my office and she said, my word's big. I'm going to go big this year. This <laughs> yeah. is me. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's fantastic. You know, And she had an idea of what that looked like. And so... Yeah. Um, so it's been something that's really stuck and people, you know, have really resonated and loved it and talk about it a lot within the office. So, you know, some people want to share their word and some people want to keep their word for themselves. And that's okay yeah. as well. You know, it can be a personal thing. Um, and very interesting, this year my word was transformation. Yeah. And, well, you know, <laughs> my whole year is transforming and I'm on a very different path to where I was this time last year. So, um, yeah, I think it's, you know, something I would encourage everyone to you know, and have some fun with it as well. Like it's a fun way to think yeah. about, you know, how do I grow in the next year and how do I evolve as a person and, you know, a partner, a leader, a mother or whatever you might be. Yeah, and it's so – because I know with my trainings that we – I often do that and get them to say, okay, one word that they're going to be in the training. Yes. And I think because you, you're planting it in their unconscious mind, mm. it's always there. Yeah. Mm. And so even their behaviour, they will reflect and say, oh, hold on, is that who I'm being? Yes, yeah. Uh, and then having that conversation with each other. So if the word's big, it's like, hold on, are you playing big yes. right now? And so that's when you can have some real fun with it. It's fantastic. Yeah. And it just, it just makes you check back in all the time and keeps you on track. And it is fun. It's yeah. great fun. Uh, work, working at such a high level, it must be important to, for you to look after your health and your well-being. And I know that's something that you've always been focused on. And I've got a memory. <laughs> I've got a memory. Well, I hope it's a good one. I know it's not a good one. <laughs> it's a memory of me, you saying to me, I've never run in my life. And you go, oh, yes. okay, JJ, you, you, yeah. can, you can run. All we'll do is we'll run from one tree yeah. to another. And I'm sure you stitched me up. I'm sure you got a, a, a street <laughs> where the freaking trees were oh, wide oh, apart. Oh, and so I'm like, I'm literally oh. dying. Uh, but you've been so great with health and well-being. So that, that's something that's not a strength of mine. It yeah. hasn't been. And I always go off and on the tangent, a bit yeah. like the news resolution. <laughs> So how have you maintained with everything else, mm. how have you maintained that? And I know yeah. it's a high value of yours. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. And first, I'm laughing because I actually remember that conversation. I'm like, <laughs> just you just go from one lamppost to the next and then you can do that and then you go to the next one and the next I one. Hated it was that like, day. I hated was, you in that moment. It was hilarious. It was hilarious. But, you know, sometimes you also need people to – these things that I'm not good at and I need pushing as well. So yeah. it's about finding that partner that will actually push you at the things that you're not good at, just like yeah. it's about finding the people to do the things that you don't like yeah. doing or, or aren't good at. So, yeah. But, yeah, I'm laughing because I do remember that moment. <laughs> Um, Look, I I suppose for me, um, you know, starting my day, the way I start my day is really important. So um, for me, I... When I'm when I'm in my normal working world, world um, yeah. I'm sort of a five o'clock, five fifteen kind of person. So I'm an early bird, right? And the first thing I have to do every day is walk. I yeah. have to get fresh air. Um, and you know, I live across from the beach, so I'm very fortunate, and I love water, um, and uh, I love that time. So for me, the 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 best way I can start my day is to have some time out. And I know that sounds funny because you've just got out of bed, yeah. um, but I need that time to think and that time to breathe and that time to have clarity for what is to come for that day. So literally without fail, I will walk the beach every single day. Now, it yeah. can be hot, cold, raining, hail. I will be down there every morning um, during, you know, uh, I so I haven't been up at 5.15. I've got to tell you, I've yeah. made the walk a little bit later. But, you know, I think it's really important the way you start your day because that sets you up, that sets your mindset up for, for the rest of yeah. the day. Um, but, you know, um, eating well, as I said, you know, all those things that you do well for yourself, eating well and, and you know, exercise and having healthy relationships. And um, and I'm a real nana, so um, my husband gets really upset at me about this because we'll just get into a really good movie or a real great Netflix series at night and I'll say I'm off to bed. I knew you were going to say yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I'm so bad. And, you know, it's kind of a ni- I'm a kind of a 9.30, 10 o'clock girl. And so I need my sleep. So I, I, yeah. I absolutely need my sleep. So, yeah, I think just making sure that start and end of your day is, is a, a real sort of priority. Yeah, I love that. So you, you're so passionate about your charity work as well. 
and you know you did the CEO sleep out years ago I remember that and you know you've worked with organizations like the Starlight Foundation and the Children's Cancer Institute tell mm. me tell me more about those two yeah look I, I am very passionate about and there's a number of others as well but yeah. um, two that I'm doing some some work with at the moment and um, and doing some support for um, but I, I'm such a huge believer that we are very privileged and very lucky uh, in the lives we live um, and um, it is so important um, to give back. Yeah. Um, and I know some people think, you know, and there's some organisations that go, if we've got a charity, let's get one because, you know, we need one and if we don't have one, we don't look that good to people. Yeah. That's not why I've ever done it. Yeah. Why I've always wanted to give back is because it's important yeah. and because we can. Um, and so I'm really passionate about two that I'm working with at the moment, um, you know, post my CEO role um, is... Um, Starlight Foundation. I've just joined um, the Starlight Foundation as the as a, um, a member of their advisory board. Yeah. Um, so I'm really excited about that because um, I'm very passionate and I love the people there and I've worked with them over a period of time. So that should be fun uh, working with them um, and seeing how I can contribute and what kind of difference I can make. Um, and then the other one, I've just become an ambassador for um, Dare to Cure, which is uh, the Children's Cancer Institute. Um, and again, something I'm very passionate about and just a fantastic bunch of people that work really, really hard. Um, and so I'm doing the um, Dare to Cure event in Sydney in October, um, which will be fun. And uh, so you you have to take on a dare. Um, oh. And it can be something like you shave your head. Well, you... can I give you the dare? So, oh, no, no, you have to pick a dare. They're really oh. great. And I've picked mine, which I'll share. Oh, damn, I um, could have given you some good dare. Yes. Um, oh, we've yeah, done a few dare well, in our life. We've probably had a few fun <laughs> dare moments. Um, but you can, you know, shave your head. You can walk on hot coals. You can trapeze. Um, you can go in a snake bath. You can go in an ice bath. And you raise money for the Children's Cancer Institute. So yeah. my idea is to go in a snake bath because I'm petrified. Wow. Um, petrified of snakes. So yeah. um, so that's going to be something that's really fun and there's just a great bunch of I don't know. People. Oh, I know. But, you know, it'll be fun in a really weird kind of way. And But a bunch of other great people who will be doing dares as well that will take them out of their comfort zones, I'm sure. But um, raising money for a fabulous cause and I'm up to about nearly $3,000, I think, already. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, it, it's, it's a really great cause. So yes, I think it's it's great when you can give back to give back, and it it doesn't need to be financial because not everyone yeah. can give back financially, and that's okay as well. But giving comes in lots of um, you know shapes and sizes, and you know yeah. giving of your time is fabulous, or you know giving someone a hand when they need it is fabulous as well. Yeah. So giving back is really important. Yeah, that's great. So. Well, with all of that you've achieved so far, what's your vision now? that you've got going forward? Yeah, that's a big question, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, let me put it like this. So my life coach, Shanna, said to me um, when I finished my 20 year, because that was my milestone, and uh, and then I decided to take some time off, uh, which I'm in now. Um, but she said to me um, when I finished, she said, Cole, life is like an exciting theme park. And you've been on the same ride for 20 years. And not that it hasn't been a great ride, it's been yeah. a spectacular ride. But now it's time to get off because there's so many new and exciting rides in that theme park yeah. um, that are new opportunities. And so for me, I'm super excited about what those new rides might be. Yeah. So you're open to all of those. I'm very open and I've got, you know, lots of things in the sort of pipeline at the moment. Yeah. And one of them... Yes. Is your book. Yes. So you got a book coming out. Well, I'm writing a book. Yes, well, it's coming, not quite coming out yet, but I'm it's writing It's coming a book. out. We'll have to do another podcast <laughs> yeah, when it comes I out. Um, can you give the listeners a sneak preview of what it's about? Mm, yes. Okay. So I, yes, I'm writing a book at the moment and ISO has been the perfect time to do that. But it, it definitely has been something I've been thinking about for a number of years, um, but clearly haven't had the time to do it. So, yeah. uh, so this has been great, but, um, and, and so I, I, I realized writing a book's really hard and I'm not <laughs> quite sure why I didn't think it would be cause I've never done it before. Yeah. So I'm like, duh, like why wouldn't it be hard? You know? Yeah. So anyway, that's another story, but it, it's, it's really hard. And it's really time consuming, but I've loved every single minute of doing it because it's kind of like this, it's kind of like one, it's writing my story, um, but two, it's about sharing and, um, 
And so it's been a, it's been a really interesting process that I've gone through. But I, I thought maybe instead of telling you what's in the book, I'll tell you the purpose of why I yeah. want to write the book. Yeah. Um, and so really my whole drive around writing my book um, is that I really want to share my story um, in the hope that I can empower other women. Um, women of all generations, not just women of our age, but younger girls, women of all generations, and maybe some men as well, right? Yeah, I, hope, I yeah. hope that happens. And I really want women to believe in themselves. I want them to believe in their ability. I want them to share their voice. Comes a bit back to what we said, how do we create more women leaders? You know, yeah. They need to share their voice. And I really want women to believe of, of the power within and that it is possible, it is absolutely possible for them to become the leader they've always wanted to be, whether that be in business or whether that be in life. And uh, I know you talked in my intro about, you know, the superpower. Um, yeah. And one of my, in part of my book, in one of the chapters, it does talk about every woman has a superpower. And, um, and, and maybe you have two, or maybe you have three. And, you know, maybe you don't know you have one, but it's time to find it. And, yeah. and I'll tell you a little story, quick stories. I, I remember growing up and we lived in, I was only young, like seven, eight, nine. And I used to have this reoccurring dream all the time. And the dream was that I could fly. And I remember it like yesterday and there was the sort of stairwell and I'd fly and, you know, I'd get up the next day and I'd tell my mum that, you know, uh, I, I was flying and eventually she said to me, um, Cole, that's your superpower, you know, one morning over breakfast. And it stuck with me for my whole life yeah. is what is my superpower? And yeah. my superpower was to fly, but not in the sense of real flying. My superpower yeah. was to fly in the way I lived my life. And yeah. my superpower is to help others fly. And so, you know, for me, it really is about empowering and inspiring women to find that superpower because it is there. Yeah. So that was, that's, that's a real part of my book is to share my story. Um, and the second one, the second sort of driver for it was that I really um, want my book to encourage um, this new era of leadership that I believe we're in and I'm very passionate about. And and it's one where we need to lead with kindness and we need to lead with humility and one that puts people at the heart of everything we do. And, and you know, the as we said earlier, we're talking the old leadership is about status and title and power and having people do what you say. And the new era of leadership is about kindness and compassion and authenticity and collaboration and trust and you know, for me, kindness, I believe, is going to be the new superpower for leaders of the future. I absolutely yeah. believe that. And, and again, don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean that kindness means, you know, uh, there's no rules. It doesn't mean you can fly under the radar. It doesn't mean there's no accountability. Yeah. You know, it doesn't mean that you allow underperformance because, you know, you have to perform. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't mean that there's no boundaries to the way, you know, you work or live your life. Of course, all of that has to be part of, of being a kind leader. But, you know, for me, kindness is about, you know, setting setting clear expectations for people. It's about giving honest feedback. And you said before, honest feedback isn't always, that isn't always what you want to hear. Yeah. You know, but kind leaders are going to give you the good and the bad and the ugly you know that's yeah. what kind leaders do because their best interest is for you to grow and yeah. you can't grow if someone just tells you every day you're doing a great job you have to know where you can improve and where you can step up and where you can push yourself out of your comfort zone so you know kindness is about encouraging growth in people it's about building true human connections and I think we don't have enough of that in organizations today even in the world we live in you know, it's about treating people like people. Um, it's about pushing people out of their comfort zone. You know, a kind a kind leader doesn't mean weakness. Yeah. In fact, to me, kindness is super courageous. And yeah. my book will talk a lot about, you know, uh, this kindness economy and being, um, you know, uh, kindness being the new superpower for leaders. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I can't wait for your book. Um, so I'll so, send you one. <laughs> I know. I want it signed. Thank you very much. <laughs> Even with a kiss on it, mm -hmm. with red lipstick. Absolutely. Um, so heaps of the listeners right now will be wanting to follow your journey. They'll be like, mm -hmm. "How can I get in? You know, be in contact and watch Cole's journey? Know when her book's out. So how will they be able to?" watch your journey and connect with you yeah look um i suppose the best place is on instagram right yeah. that's where it's calling uh, underscore calendar um 
if you want to jump on and even send me a message, that'd be nice too. Yeah. Um, and I'm in the process of uh, building my website and doing all of that at the moment in preparation for my book coming out. But Instagram is probably the best place to contact me and shoot me a message. Beautiful. So I will put that link, your uh, Instagram link, so that people can connect with you and okay. follow your journey. And as soon as your book's out, they can grab hold of your book wonderful you're not get, oh, for those of you you're not going to get the kiss on your book i yeah. only get the kiss because we've been friends for 30 <laughs> yes, years exactly. so you don't get the kiss uh all right i've got some rapid fire jj rapid Ooh. fire questions okay now for someone that likes control she yes. has seen these questions mm-hmm. and i know she's probably thinking what the hell are yeah. you gonna ask me there could be some left of field ones here aren't you? oh they're all fun so your first one is the best piece of advice that you've been given be you. Be you. Love it. Your favourite book? I'm actually reading Becoming by <gasps> Michelle Obama at yeah. the moment and I'm really loving that. I yeah. would say that's, you know, one that comes to mind because I'm reading at the moment, but a yeah. fabulous, fabulous book. Beautiful. Who would play you in a movie? Ooh, who would play me? Ooh, I don't know, maybe, um, only maybe because, maybe Nicole Kidman. <gasps> oh, <that's laughs> Because you know my well. hair is actually really curly and I straighten it, so we kind of have something in common. One well, I'm thing. Scre- I'm screaming now. <laughs> one thing. <laughs> we have one thing in common. I was thinking the same thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, what's one thing on your bucket list? Um, well, it was to write a book, so I'm I'm kind of hopefully yeah. achieving that. Yeah. Mm. Um, if you could trade lives with anyone for one day, who would it be and why? Mm. Sometimes I think it would be my daughter um, because she has a damn great life. But, um, oh, wow, who would that be? That's a really tricky question. Um, mm, Who would I trade lives with? Um, Oh, I can't think of one particular person, but someone who's caring and nice. Yeah, oh, well, you don't have to trade lives. Um, (laughs) Three words that describe you. Uh, Passionate, hardworking and authentic. If you could have five, here's another challenging one. Mm. If you could have five people mm. to have dinner with, now whether they're dead or alive at the moment, mm. who would you choose and why? Oh, I would choose. Um, mm, I would choose Michelle Obama. Yeah, I might let her bring her husband just as a plus one. And we won't. <laughs> we won't count him in as the five. <laughs> we won't count him in as the five. Um, I wow, Mother Teresa. Um, I would bring um, um, George Clooney just because we I need some. Say yeah, George Clooney. Just because we need some eye candy at the table. <laughs> um, I would bring. Um, I would bring. I don't know. Um, who else might I bring? Ooh, I bring my husband. Oh, yeah. Is that five? Yeah. Oh, that did five? you count at Obama? Oh, maybe I added him. <laughs> I'd invite you as well, Janelle, because oh, okay, you're lots of fun. <laughs> Uh, what if if you could have one superpower other than all the superpowers you've got? What would you have? Mm. A real superpower would be to fly. Yeah, I'd love to be able to fly, and you we will be able yeah. to in the future. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think you know my my superpowers are uh, being an authentic human yeah. um, and inspiring others. Love it. What TV sitcom family would you be a member of? Oh, do you know, I'm not a sitcom fan at all, Aren't but you? the only thing I can relate to is Sex in the City because I love a oh. Cosmopolitan. <laughs> That's probably about the only sitcom I can relate to. I'm not really a TV person. <laughs> and anyone from my team who's listening to this or my sports school team will absolutely laugh their head off because they know how much I, I love a Cosmopolitan and they always say, is that because of Sex in the City? And I'm like, no, I don't act, I've never watched an episode. Oh, there it. you go. You yeah. just be in it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and the last question is, what legacy do you want to be remembered for? Mm, I just want to be remembered as a great human being and yeah. someone who has been an authentic and caring leader um, and has inspired and empowered others to be the best versions of themselves. Beautiful. Mm. Well, thank you for today. Yay! Yay. Thank you. That <laughs> went really long. And, <laughs> And as I said, I think that you, we will definitely do another podcast once your book's out and get to make sure you get in contact with and watch Colleen on Instagram. And, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure and oh. I can't wait to 
I, I told you I'll have to just keep making podcasts so that we can catch up. <laughs> oh, it's been so beautiful. Thank yeah. you. Love you so My much. Mwah. Okay, thanks, guys. See you later. Thanks for tuning in to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast and follow me on Instagram at JJ Speaker Coach. And remember to live with insatiable passion, create an empowered life and inspire others to live theirs.